The Tavern Brawler Thrower is easily one of the strongest builds in the game thanks to Tavern Brawler, which adds twice your strength modifier to the damage and attack rolls when you throw. The extra damage being treated as a separate damage source leads to incredibly high damaging throws, especially when combined with the right equipment and a good throwing weapon. This build is also amazing because it's incredibly simple and very straightforward to put together. So if you're looking for an extremely powerful build that doesn't require multi-classing, this is it. To get started, start as as a level 1 Barbarian. As a Barbarian, you have Unarmored Defense, which adds your Constitution modifier to your armor class in addition to your Dexterity modifier when not wearing armor. So make sure not to wear armor while playing as a Barbarian. You'll also be unable to rage when you wear armor, so you'll know if you're accidentally wearing armor. At level 3, choose Berserker. This gives you access to Frenzy. Frenzy upgrades your rage, granting Enrage to throw, which is a bonus action. So you can now start combat with a throw and Frenzy, and then each turn after get two throws. At level 4, you'll get a massive power spike with your first feat. Choose Tavern Brawler and put one point into strength, bringing it to 18. Tavern Brawler adds your strength modifier twice to the damage and attack rolls to your throws and is a key feat of this build. At level five, you unlock extra attack. You can now throw twice on your first turn, use Frenzy as your bonus action, and then throw three times each turn after that. Between levels six and seven, you're going to want to change your class to Fighter. This change depends on when you reach Act Two and acquire the Lightning Jabber, which we'll talk more about in the equipment section. But once you get this spear, that's the cue to go to Withers and change your class to Fighter. So at level one Fighter, choose Dueling Fighting Style. This actually adds plus two damage when you throw once you get dual wielding, because once you throw your weapon, the game actually registers you as having just a single weapon in your hand, and you'll deal this additional plus two damage on every single throw. So it's totally worth it. At level three, choose Eldritch Knight. This gives you Weapon Bond, which ritually binds your weapon to your main hand, causing it to automatically return to you. Since Lightning Jabber doesn't do that automatically, make sure to bind it after each long rest. For cantrips, choose Light. Light is important because once we get Callus Glow Ring, we'll need to always have a light on our thrown weapon to activate the bonus damage. For your other cantrip, if this is your dialogue character, choose Friends, otherwise Minor Illusion. Minor Illusion can be used to group up enemies for big AoE damage using Nyrulna later. For spells, choose Shield and Thunder Wave. Shield is extremely powerful to gain 5 AC as a reaction, and since we really won't be using our spell slots almost at all, you'll get to activate this a lot. Thunder Wave can be used situationally to knock enemies into chasms or to get rid of disadvantage from threatened, but honestly, you probably will never use it. For your expanded spell slot, choose Expeditious Retreat. This spell gives you dash immediately and as a bonus action on each of your turns until long rest. Make sure to use Expeditious Retreat after each long rest because you'll want to be able to use this bonus action dash immediately in combat as your bonus action each turn before throwing when wearing the speedy light feat to generate three lightning charges per turn. These lightning charges grant plus one to attack rolls and cause you to deal one additional lightning damage and at five charges you'll deal an additional 1d8 lightning damage. At level four you can choose any spell and you'll get your first feat and again choose tavern brawler and put that ability point into strength at level five replace the spell you chose at level four and choose long strider if your party doesn't have it yet if it does you can choose false life feather fall enhanced leap or disguise self depending on what your party needs at level six replace thunder wave with any of the spells mentioned in the level five section and for your feet choose dual wielder you can now equip your stat stick i prefer knife of the undermountain king and you'll get plus one ac for for doing so in addition to the increased critical strike chance. Also, you'll now be getting that plus two damage to each throw thanks to the dueling fighting style. At level seven, you get to choose two more spells. Any of them are fine choices since we're very unlikely to be using them and we'll be replacing them later. At level eight, choose Misty Step. This is the final key spell of this build which will help you get into position. Because the trajectory arc of throwing, positioning is more important than any other build and Misty Step can help you get at the perfect angle to throw when you're in tricky areas. Replace one of the spells you chose at level 7, and if you haven't already, definitely get Disguise Self now. You'll need this for when you get Dwarven Thrower in Act 3 to activate that bonus damage. For your feat, choose Ability Improvement Strength. You should now have 20 or 22 Strength, depending on if you acquired the Potion of Everlasting Vigor from Araj Abludra in Act 2, which grants plus 2 Strength permanently. At level 9, change out the second spell you chose at level 7 for C Invisibility. This will be really helpful for Act 3. At level 10, 
10, you get a new cantrip, choose friends or minor illusion, and a new spell, which you can choose anything. At level 11, you get improved extra attack, allowing you three throws per turn. With action surge, you'll get six throws in a turn. Choose another spell and switch out the spell you chose at level 10 for one of the spells you're missing from the list we went through at level nine. And at level 12, again, switch out one of the spells you chose at level 11 and switch to one of the spells you're missing from the list we went through at level nine. You'll also get your final feat. I would choose alert. This gives you a plus five bonus to initiative and you can't be surprised. With this feat, you'll be able to take out multiple enemies before they even get a turn because you're going first, which can really help turn the tide in a battle. And your final build will be 12 fighter. Nice and simple. Next up is best in slot gear. Warning, there are spoilers ahead. So the best helm for this build is Saravox Horned Helmet. The number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one while you wear this helm, and it also makes you immune to fear and other emotion altering conditions. On top of that, it also grants dark vision up to 10 feet or 50 feet if you already have it. We mainly want this just for the critical strike chance, and you can loot this helm from Saravok Anchev in Act 3 within the Murder Tribunal. Since this is an Act 3 helmet, the Grimeskull Helm is another great option from Act 1, granting Hunter's Mark as a bonus action, which is very powerful, and also it makes it so you cannot be critically hit, which is great. And you can loot that helm from Grime in the Adamantite Forge. And the best cloak for this build is the Death Stalker Mantle. This cloak grants invisibility for two turns after killing an enemy once per turn. This gives you advantage on your next attack roll coming out of invisibility. This is really the only cloak that adds offensive power to the build and it's Dark Urge only. So if you're not playing Dark Urge, I would go with Cloak of Protection, which is a strong defensive option. You'll get the Death Stalker Mantle by long resting as the Dark Urge and the Cloak of Protection can be purchased off Quartermaster Tali. The best armor for this build is the Hell Dusk Armor. Since there aren't any great offensive options, this is the strongest defensive option. You take three less damage from all sources, gain resistance to fire damage, and if you succeed a saving throw, the caster receives burning for three turns. This armor is dropped off Raphael in the House of Hope. The best gloves for this build are the Gloves of Uninhibited Kushigo. These gloves are perfect for a throwing build because they add 1d4 damage to throw attacks. You need to be careful when playing because in order to get these, you have to save Dareth Bone Cloak from the field of Bibberbang Mushrooms in the Underdark. You can very easily miss these if he dies. And the best boots for this build are the Speedy Light Feet. When you dash wearing these boots, you gain three lightning charges. These lightning charges add plus one to attack rolls and cause you to deal an additional one damage. If you gain five charges, they are consumed the next time you deal damage and you deal an additional 1d8 lightning damage. These boots are the main reason we get Expeditious Retreat to dash as a bonus action each turn to generate lightning charges. These are found inside a heavy chest in the cellar beneath the windmill in the Blighted Village in Act 1. And the best amulet for this build is the Amulet of Greater Health. This sets your constitution score to 23 and gives you advantage on constitution saving throws. The extra health is great, but also the advantage on constitution saving throws is incredible to avoid losing concentration on expeditious retreat so that we're at no risk of losing our ability to generate lightning charges each turn. And you can get this from a pedestal in the House of Hope. The first ring you'll want to get is the Ring of Flinging. This ring is perfect for throwing because it grants plus 1d4 bonus to throw damage. This can be bought from Aaron in the Druid Grove, pretty much the first trader you see in the game. And the second ring you'll want is the Callus glow ring. This ring causes the wearer to deal an additional two points of radiant damage against creatures that are illuminated. The callous glow ring is inside an opulent chest inside the vault near Balthazar in the Gauntlet of Shar and make sure that you cast light on your weapon before you throw it in order to get these two points of radiant damage. Nyrulna already has light so you don't need to cast it on that particular weapon. The first melee weapon you'll want to seek out is the returning pike and the reason you want to get this as soon as possible is because it has homing weapon. This weapon will return to its own owner when thrown, which allows it to be used over and over without running out of weapons to throw. And you can purchase this from Grat the Trader in the Goblin Camp. You can go there almost immediately if you have Disguise Self Drow, since goblins are filled with awe when they see Drow, and make sure to get the waypoint while you're there. The second weapon you'll want to seek out is the Lightning Jabber. The Lightning Jabber deals an additional 1d4 lightning damage when thrown at a target, which is considered yet another separate damage source, making this one of the best throwing weapons really in the entire game. And you can get this off the Kua Toa Chieftain right outside the Grand Mausoleum in Act 2. He's a level 7 surrounded by a lot of Kua Toa, so don't rush there too soon if you're too low level. And third, the Dwarven Thrower. The 
Dwarven Thrower has homing weapon returning when thrown and deals an additional 1d8 bludgeoning damage if a dwarf is the one throwing it. So use Disguise Self when you use this weapon, unless you're already a dwarf. It deals up to 2d8 additional bludgeoning damage if the target is large, huge, or gargantuan, which makes this your best weapon against those enemy types. You can purchase this off Ferg Droger in Rivington in Act 3, as long as Shadowheart isn't an active party member. Fourth, and in most cases your best weapon for this build, is Nyrulna. Nyrulna deals 3d4 thunder damage and an explosion when thrown, and it has glowing, which shines a light in a radius of 6 meters, which pairs perfectly with the callus glow ring, and the thunder damage is considered a separate damage source. The AoE from Nyrulna makes this weapon deal the most damage out of all of your options if there are enemies close to each other, but if you have a lot of melee party members, you're going to be better off using the Dwarven Thrower so that you don't inflict too much damage on your own party members. Also, really importantly, in combat, make sure not to throw Nyrulna and then throw Dwarven Thrower immediately after. This will unequip your offhand weapon and you'll lose the bonus damage from dueling fighting style and the stats from the weapon, which would be in our case critical strike chance. So make sure to either choose one or the other and stick to it throughout combat. I know it's very tempting to use Dwarven Thrower for single target and then switch to Nyrulna for AoE, but don't do that within combat. If you're going to switch, do it manually outside of combat. Don't let one of the throwing weapons replace your offhand stat stick. And speaking of offhand stat stick, the best offhand weapon for this build is the Knife of the Undermountain King. This knife reduces the number you need to roll a critical hit by one, which is very strong, and the Knife of the Undermountain King can be purchased from Ajak near Jira in Kresh Yelik. You could also use Bloodthirst, since this Knife of the Undermountain King is used in so many builds, and I would say the two are pretty interchangeable. For your ranged weapon slot, the Deadshot is the best for this build because it reduces the number you need to roll a critical hit by one, which is very strong. And those are the best in slot items. This build is great to run because of its simplicity and how incredibly strong it is. And another great reason to run a throwing build is because of the interaction with soul branding. Soul branding is a bonus action only available to Minthara, which increases the target's movement speed by 1.5 meters and its next attack deals an additional 2d4 plus 1 fire damage. This condition ends upon landing a successful attack, otherwise it lasts 3 turns. However, when used on a throw thrower, soul branding does not end after a throw, and the throw gets the bonus fire damage each time. So soul branding is really, really great for throwers, another reason to possibly choose the build, or another reason to make sure you recruit Minthara if you're going to go a throwing build. Now overall, this build is one of the most powerful in Baldur's Gate 3, and will certainly make Tactician or even Honored Difficulty seem easy because of how incredibly strong it is.